Kickstarter, Public Readings, and Digital Media. This episode, a conversation with writer and professor Brad King. Writers are generally writers because they're terrible in person, right? Like, they're generally not the kind of people that do well in a crowd. I'm Chris Well, and this is DIY Author. You're an author. Maybe you're taking the traditional route. Maybe you've chosen an independent path. Or maybe you want the best of both worlds. Wherever you want to go as a writer, DIY Author is here to help you on your journey with advice, encouragement, and practical tips. Because do it yourself doesn't have to mean do it alone. Welcome to DIY Author. I'm your host, Chris Well. Our guest this episode is Brad King, an assistant professor of journalism at Ball State University. He is also the director of that university's digital media minor, where he teaches students of all types how to embrace the intersections between technology, storytelling, and real life. Brad is also a writer and the founder of The Geeky Press, a loose collective of independent authors. And he's working on a book that has already been funded through Kickstarter. In this conversation, we discuss the value of authors connecting with people in the real world, a better alternative to public readings, and the absolute worst way to run a Kickstarter campaign. Here's our interview. And now I'm speaking with Brad King. He is a teacher. He is an author. He is the uh, the ringleader at the Geeky Press. Welcome, Brad. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Thank you. You know, I don't think anyone's asked me that before. So you are officially the most polite person we've had on the show. My mother and father will be very happy to hear that. And I'm sure they're big fans of the show. <laughs> yeah. So that, they will they will hear this. You There are so many different things that you do that are writer-related. So we're just going to try to kind of navigate our way through this to help the listeners understand what's going on. You know, what's interesting. For it, It's been for the last 10 years, I've tried to figure out how it all fits together. Because it's, mm-hmm. it is all different, but it's all the right. same thing. And so... The Geeky Press is actually about 10 years of thinking on my part. Tell, okay, tell us where and what you teach. Let's start with that. So uh, right now I'm at uh, Ball State University, which is in Muncie, Indiana, it's the, uh, Dave Letterman's alma mater. I actually mm. teach part of what I do is in the Dave Letterman building. I'm in the journalism. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. You mean it's actually named that? It is. It's the David Letterman building. That's great. His, uh, I love that. It's, what's funny is that he didn't, uh, a funny story is that he didn't want, he's a very humble person. He didn't want his name on the building. And his mom had to remind him that Letterman was not his name, but it was his father's <laughs> name. So it's actually, actually the Dave, the Letterman building is named after Dave Letterman's father. <laughs> So yeah, it's so it's it's great. Um, Ball State is known for um, its media production, and 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 we have a uh, three buildings, four floors of media production stuff. So for what I do, it's a playground. Part of my job here is to run a thing called the Digital Media Minor. So I teach kids from all backgrounds how to use technology to create digital stories for whatever it is they do. So history majors, theater majors, journalism majors, whatever they use, to sort of understand that these storytelling tools are important for all the aspects uh, of what we do today. I mean, it's why Cosmos is important, right? Like Neil deGrasse Tyson calls himself a science communicator. What he is doing is telling stories about science so that you understand how it works. And to a small extent, that's what we're trying to do in the digital media minor, which is to infuse storytelling into these other areas that traditionally people don't think of as storytelling. Now, one of the, uh, I guess you'd say one of the spokes in the wheel for, uh, and it look, I, I think it's connected to the digital media minor is uh, the, uh, and I don't know how to, I should have asked you how to pronounce this earlier. It, Invictus, Invitus writers? The Invictus writers. Okay. What is that? So, you know, I, I, because I teach this digital storytelling stuff, but I'm a writer at heart, I started a project. It's not a class. It's not a club. It's not a group. I choose young writers at my university who want to be writers, and I put them in a group for a year. And we meet once a month. Um, we have some online collaborations, but we get together in a room, and they write a 10,000-word memoir. The sort of guiding force behind it is the moment in your life when everything changed, right? And so everybody has these series of lives or these series of moments, 
And it's a good way, one, for kids to understand what it's like to have somebody write about you, only it's them writing about themselves. It forces them to go back into their lives and ask questions about, from and to find out how other people experience moments in their lives. And it, in that sense, it's like a humanities because they have to understand that their experience is not the experience. It's just a experience. And as a writer, it's so important to understand that stories are not just what you perceive them to be. They're what everybody perceives them to be. So they go through this project for a year, year and a half, depending on how long it takes. They learn what it means to be a writer. They learn what it means to actually interview people in a meaningful way where you're not trying to extract information. You're trying to understand the human condition. Like what was it that stuck with people and how did they respond to things? And then how to write a story about themselves that isn't about them, right? That is about some larger thing. And then we publish it as a book. You know, I, have an I, well, I buy an ISBN number. We get a Library of Congress number. We design it. We hire a copy editor. But really it's to teach them how to be writers, which you can't do in a classroom. Now, the, the classes you described earlier was a lot of people coming from not like a non-writer yep. place to learn about storytelling. Are you saying that these are, are these those people that end up in the Invictus Writers or these are people who come from a writing place? They come from and a you're writing just, place. So okay. uh, lots of the classes that I teach outside of the minor are magazine, long form journalism. So most of the kids are students that I've had in the introductory introduction to magazine journalism. They've done work with me and I have chosen them because I feel like they have promise. They don't have to be good writers. They just have to show promise. But I also get kids that come from the English department. I have several friends in the creative nonfiction realm who recommend students to me, but I'm pretty particular. A lot of students want to be in it, and I take between six and eight a year. Um, and of those, just because you're in it doesn't mean your story ends up in the book. I, you know, about 40% of the kids write pieces that I just aren't good enough, which, as we say, failure is part of learning. And so the reason they don't go in the book is because a great piece of writing next to a bad piece of writing looks worse. And so we don't want to embarrass kids whose work isn't yet ready for prime time. And, you know, writing is hard and it's a process. Some people get it sooner than other folks. So this is just sort of a, the beginning step on their continuum of what it means to be a writer. And, and so with some of these things that you're doing – I mean, these are there's an educational core to what's going on, but is there is there an entry point for like people listening now? Is there an entry point for them to like, oh, you can go find the book here, or there are videos online from? Is are there entry points for the outsiders? Yeah, so the for the teaching stuff, all of my classes uh, are I post them online, and those are at the dudeman.net. dot net. So people that are interested in you know social media and those kinds of things, you go to the dudeman dot net, and you can actually take the class so to speak all the videos are there the lectures are there the readings are there in terms of writing i I started this collaboration called the geeky press Mm -hmm. um, which is a it's a loose collection of writers that i know from around the world and it's not a press in the fact that we publish anything like i'm not trying to own anybody's copyright i'm not trying to like you know do any of that stuff it is more a writing collective the Invictus writers are there. My writing partner on our book, Dungeons and Dreamers, John, is there. Some friends from Berkeley are there. And what I'm actively doing right now is recruiting writers who I think are interesting, who are looking to be part of a collective. And that means, you know, lots of things. Um, we have a private G plus, uh, Google plus community where we share reading and we talk about issues and we, you know, people sort of come and go as they have time. I write about in my Invictus kids blog about issues around writing. You know, we have a newsletter where we talk about not stuff that you can see every day. Like I'm not trying to review the latest New York times bestselling book. Like we essentially think of what we do as an indie rock label. Like we're looking for things that we think are cool that you're not going to find other places. And so we depend on people to tell us, like, what is that stuff? Like, what is it that you think is neat? What is it that we should be knowing? What should we know about? 
And that's sort of the entry point, right? Like the Geeky Press really is this place for writers to hang out. It's a weird thing that we're doing because it's kind of online and kind of not online. Um, mm-hmm. It has lots of levels of participation depending on how much you want to participate. I do a monthly writer's hack where I, I, I rent some space in a co-working place and I take six to eight people who want to go down and we, and we just go down and write. And then afterwards we have lunch. There is the online community where people share reading and stuff and they sort of come and go and they share. And sometimes it's interesting stuff that's going on. Sometimes it's problems they're having with the writing. Um, sometimes it leads to people having hangouts or conversations. So if you don't live in Indiana, you can do stuff online. If you do live in Indiana, you can do the monthly writing series. Um, I'm putting together a quarterly reading series called the Downtown Writers Jam, where I am working with people um, in the Indiana region to submit work and come down and tell stories to a crowd. So that, you know, there's if you have a project that's interesting and you want to write about it, we have right now we have about 5000 people that come to the site every month, which isn't a big, huge number, but it's been going for six weeks. So I feel like, uh, you know, about we've had about 10,000 people already come through the site and we get a you know, we have a pretty good return rate It's about 45 percent of the people return, which means it's we're not necessarily just churning through Reddit folks who come in and then leave. If you have a project, it's a good place to, like, talk about your project. And that takes place in lots of different ways. If you want to repurpose a blog, you can do that. If you want to do a Q&A with us, we'll do that. Like, it, it's sort of how people want to interact. Okay, I <laughs> there, there are so many things connected to so many things that you do that I'm – I'm both trying to follow what you're saying and trying to figure out uh, – because I had, all of, of course, all these questions down, and we're, we're bouncing around. <laughs> right. That's crazy. It immediately um, – so, so the thing that you ju- – and people at home, maybe they are already following this, but the thing that you just said about repurposing a blog or a Q&A, is that for the jam or you mean on the, the, like the G Plus community? I mean, so the geekypress.com is a site. And on that site is a blog, and and there's lots of different blogs for different books and projects that I run or that I'm affiliated with. And so there was a guy down in Brazil who's doing a crowdsourced book on computer role-playing games, which I think is just awesome. And he has all these people lined up to do it. And so I asked him to write a blog about the project. Um, He repurposed some stuff that he had written. We posted it on the site, and I posted it in Reddit and started a a conversation in Reddit, and he got about 500 people that asked if they could be part of the project. And so if you have something that's interesting, we want to hear about it so that we can help you do the thing that you want to do. And if along the way you decide, hey, I'd really like to be part of this, and you'd like to be one of the people that goes out and looks for these things and writes about them on our site – that's great. If you don't because you're too busy doing your own thing and we can help you do your thing, that's great too. It is, it's hard to understand because it's not a business. I'm not trying to own anything. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm not trying to do anything other than be awesome with words. And however we can help that out, with bookstores going away, with independent bookstores having a hard time with things, writers need to band together to, to figure out like, how do we let people know what we're doing? Um, and the New York Times is great if you write a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> and it's not so great if you don't. Yeah, if you're, part, if you're one of the 20, yeah. the list is great. But Right. And so we sort of exist between – here's how I, what I tell people. It, we do a thing that I call professionalized amateurism. Everything we do – I hire copy editors. I hire designers. We don't just publish things that we write and then hit the publish button on. Like when we do a project, it I hire professionals to help us out. I just don't go through a traditional publishing house. And so if I'm talking about the crowdsourced book that the guy in Brazil is doing, that may not be he may not. I mean, he said he's going to hire a copy editor. He's going to hire a designer like they're doing things in a way that I think is going to be more it's not going to be a crappy project it's a project that i think is actually going to be a worthwhile endeavor 
That's what we're interested in, right? It's that mid-level stuff that used to be the lifeblood of the industry that now doesn't have the kind of support in the industry. If we're going to be writers, we have to support that. And people like me who are lucky enough to have a job as a professor where I get a, a lot of leeway to do the kinds of things that I want to do, I have a background from Berkeley and Wired and MIT that I understand this stuff. I'm not famous. Nobody, I mean, 15 years ago in the tech industry, people knew my name, but it's been a long time since anybody said Brad King and thought, oh, yeah, the writer. But I know enough of this stuff to I can work with these small presses, literary magazines, people who want to write, who are at the beginning of their career, who want to do it professionally, you know, who aren't just trying to write something without an editor, without a copy editor, like, they don't need me, like, because th they're doing things on their own. We're we're looking for a different group of people. So let's let's go back to the the uh, the live event, yeah. uh, the uh, downtown jam. The that's, downtown that's the name of it. Jam. Okay, so is this you have one coming up? Uh, as as we're talking, there's one coming up in July 2014. Yep. Is that the first one? It is the first one. Okay, so you actually don't know all the ways it can go wrong yet. I have a pretty good idea all the ways that it okay. can go wrong because I've been doing things like this for a while. In fact, okay. I expect it to be a um, a brilliant failure. It's sort of a live book reading, but it's it's very clear that, what is it, no podium, you're not allowed to hold the papers in your hands, yes. and you're pretty much nose-to-nose -nose with the audience. Yes, no reading. No reading at the book right. reading. <laughs> yeah. So what what is the range of the kinds of uh, stories? And uh, I mean, is it poetry? Is it memoir? Is it fiction? What what what's going to be there? So everything but poetry. I hate poetry. Okay. <laughs> um, so right now I have two or three people that have submitted. We don't even know who the readers are going to be yet. Um, I'm working with small presses and literary magazines in the sort of Indiana and, and, and greater Indiana area. So I know at some point I'll get, you know, 15 or 20 applications. It's anything. Graphic novel, screenplay, fiction, nonfiction. I don't care about the genre. No poetry. Everything but poetry is how I sort of pitch it to people. Mm -hmm. All that it has to do is be from a finished work. You get to define what finished means. So I'm not going to deny somebody. I, like, my job is not to be traffic cop and mother and father. I read the submissions and I'll choose the ones that I think are the most interesting. And then we're going to get a crowd together at Indi uh, Indie Reads Books, which is a nonprofit bookstore that does adult literacy. And we're going to gather a crowd there and six to eight authors are going to walk out to the middle of the room. They have 10 minutes and they're going to tell their favorite story. It's modeled after the Uptown Poetry Slam, which happens in Chicago. A guy named Mark Smith, who helped found the uh, Poetry Slam movement in America. He came out of New York um, with Jim Carroll and Patti Smith in the 70s. He's been running this thing for 30 years. And it's a three-hour Poetry Slam that happens in the Green Mill in Chicago. And it's amazing. It's amazing to be in that environment and to see an interactive crowd of people who are responding to what these poets are doing. And my contention has always been, if I'm an author... A reading is the worst way for you to experience the thing that I've put on the page. I wrote it. I don't need to read it to you. If you'd like to read it, read it yourself. What I'm really interested in is to hear the author tell a story from the book. Get me in a room with you and tell me why I should love these people. Tell me the story the way that it exists in your head, knowing full well that writers are generally writers because they're terrible in person, right? Like they're, they're generally not the kind of people that do well in a crowd. And that's the brilliance of it, right? Like seeing somebody's handshake while they're telling you a story tells you so much about the words they put on the page. Seeing someone like me, who's very comfortable, who I come from a storytelling culture, like, I like that tells you something about what you see on the page. Like that's the thing that I think a reading should be like. They should be the author, not the words on the page. So say, for instance, it was me. I write mysteries. So are you saying that I would be 
I would be uh, orating my story, or I would be talking about my story. You would pick a story from your book, a scene, an anecdote, and you would tell us that story. So you're not talking so like, about like, like a ten minute piece of my book. Yep, up to ten. You can do four minutes if ten. you want that. Okay. Like, at ten minutes, I will stand up and cut okay. you off. Okay. Um, All right. There will also be some audience interaction that will happen as well that the authors don't yet know about. So, so, so I'd be uh, ducking the flying uh, beer bottles. Yes. And <laughs> yes. And, and and am I? Would I be? Is it? I'm doing a, trying to do a dramatic reading, or am I just? This is just me. You know, I guess, I guess really it's just whatever they want to do as long as it's not boring. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like I will, I'm happy to give people parameters if they want them because I know sometimes people get really nervous about that. But as I've told authors, like if I want to see a dramatic reading, I'm going to go to the theater, right? Mm-hmm. Like you, this is you don't need to put on a costume unless you decide this is how I want to do this, right? Like it is the author in the rawest form that the author exists, which is without the comfort of an edit and without the comfort of the blank page, right? Like I want the audience to see when I write, there's a movie in my head. I I see what I'm about to put down on the page, right? And as much as I love the page, it never quite matches up the, 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 the movie in my head. And so this is a chance to, to experience that movie for the author in a different way. And to get people excited about the story in a different way. I just hate readings because I feel like readings were put together by publishers who don't understand what authors do. And so they said, look, you've written this book that's great. And it's, you know, it's wonderful. And what we'd really like you to do is go out in public and open that up and read it. And you think, well, no, I wrote it so that people could sit at home and read. Like, I don't, I don't, why would I read it to them? Um, but I don't think people really think about what is it that authors bring to the party? Like you can go to the movies, you can go to the theater, you can go to a rock show, you can go to a photography exhibit or what you go to the library and listen to somebody read to you. The worst interactive experience that you could possibly do to go into an environment where you have authors forced to put the book down and tell you a story, that to me seems way more fun for everybody. For everybody. Although the authors will probably be stressed out. So for those authors who, who do make the plunge, they and for some of them, uh, this is going to be probably the scariest moment in their lives. Mm-hmm. Is this something that, like, oh, now that I've done that, I I should start doing it again? Is this a thing that is important to the writer's journey to be able to do this kind of thing? Or is it just, oh, I'm glad I did that, now I'm done? I mean, I guess it's going to depend on the individual author. For me, I write so that people can read it. And I write so that I get an audience. Whatever that audience is, like, I'm always very fascinated by them. If there's never another reading in the history of authorship... I feel like the world would be in a very good place because I've written the book. The reading actually happens by the individual writer. And the other thing is, is authors have separated themselves so much from their audience. Not that you write and take feedback from them, but the brilliance of being an author is that you get to go into everybody's home. You get to go into everybody's environment. You are there with them. And yet you're never forced to be with them. And I think that's a really bad way for an author To be, you need to be out amongst people because if you're not going to be amongst them and you're not going to engage them in interesting ways, then you don't have the right to say, why don't people read what I do? Why don't people show up when we do these things? You know what I mean? If you're making it boring and staying away from folks, then people will stop paying attention to you. And to me, writing is the greatest thing in the world. Literacy is like I've traveled the universe because of Isaac Asimov. I've gone through time because of Fitzgerald. Like, I, you know, like these are people that transport me all over the place and I would die to be in a place where they would were telling stories. I, I would I would give almost anything to be in those rooms. So is it necessary to be a writer? No. But it, if you want an audience, unless you're one of those lucky people where folks just find you, you have to go give them a reason to be interested in you. That's like. That's the Brad King rant. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure we get to the Kickstarter thing. Yeah. 
So let's talk a moment about you as an author. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, another book that you've written, but this the, the the Appalachian book. This is is it new? Is it out or it's, co- it's coming? No, no, I'm I'm actually in the process of writing it right now. So you you went on Kickstarter with a book that you had not yet written, yep. and you got it funded. Yeah, we raised about eleven thousand dollars. Let's start with the book. Tell us about the book. So a few years ago, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers, and the second part of that book was about my family. He used my family as uh, an example of a culture of violence that perpetuates itself. My family's been in Appalachia for 200 years. They helped settle large parts of Kentucky, large parts of the area that we settled are poor. And if you look at a very specific part of our history, Malcolm Gladwell's argument makes a lot of sense that Appalachians are poor and violent because they come from poor and violent places and they pass those things along. But actually, my family's history is documented back to the 1500s in England, and it's far more interesting than that. We were part of the royal court. We came to America as gunmakers. So the story, So Far Appalachia, is about America, is about understanding how we have ended up here today, where we are so polarized around these kinds of issues around guns and and education and um, religion. And using my family's history to explain how America ended up here today. So instead of sort of taking Gladwell's idea that Appalachians are these sort of violent people that come from a violent culture, stepping back and going, actually, it's a far more complicated and far more interesting story about how we got here. Um, and that it's not, it, it's not as easy as saying people are violent and so they beget violence. Um, we were well to do rich, People, the the king didn't send people to America to make guns who were poor. (laughs) So it really is. It's a book about my family, but it's more of a book about America. You went to Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. What was the funding for and why did you go to Kickstarter specifically? So uh, I went there with a story. I know my family's history, so I I told an interesting story, uh, what I think is an interesting story. Uh, I had put together a book proposal because, again, I think in terms of professionalized amateurism. So I have written book proposals before. I wrote one. I knew exactly what the book was going to be about. The $11,000 was to hire a book editor, uh, a copy editor, a designer. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to hire the PR firm myself and to pay for some travel because my family's now scattered around the country. Um, So I had all that stuff listed and said, like, here's how I'm going to spend the money. And I basically told people what I just told you, which is, here's the story. I didn't tell you the story of my family, but I said, here's the story of my family. And here's the way they're portrayed. And I think this says a lot about who we are today. And I don't want to go through a publishing house because typically publishing houses, when they hear Appalachia, they want you to write about feuds and hillbillies and they want to put mountains on the cover. And that's the exact opposite of the thing that I want to do, which is to not say Appalachia is different than America, but to say Appalachia is the American experience. And you have to understand it to understand how these sort of things about guns and religion have filtered out into the culture. Otherwise, you're just grasping at straws and never really getting what this country is about. Good and bad. So I refer to it as, you know, the other kind of American story. So that was what I asked people to do. And I, you know my backers get to see the process as it happens. They are seeing drafts of the story. They're giving me feedback and it's helping me make sure I craft the kind of narrative that I want to craft. How much of the the backing came from people that you had existing followers versus these are people that learned about it through Kickstarter or as the Kickstarter was promoted? Yeah. So, Here's the, it's funny. I, I build these communities and I did such a terrible job with Kickstarter. If I could go back and do it again, I would have spent a good few months talking with many of the Appalachian coalitions that I now talk with and really let them know what I was doing to have them promote out what I was doing before I launched it. And instead, I put this thing together and launched like a lunatic into it. And then spend a lot of time trying to get people at the last minute to spread the word. I would say probably half of the, the, the money came from people that I knew. And probably 25% of it came from their friends. 
Um, and then 25% of it came from people who found out about it. But it was so poorly planned out, I can't even begin to tell you. I would sit under my desk curled up in the fetal position because I I was so concerned I wasn't going to raise the money and that I was going to have to go through a publishing house. Because I had agents who were interested in, in the book, and I didn't want to go that route. When I know it sounds silly to be underneath the desk, but like this is the project that I've waited my whole life to do. This is the story of my family. So it is a intensely personal thing, as you might imagine. And then to have planned it so poorly <laughs> was not one of my finer. My wife was very happy when the Kickstarter made. Hmm. It was fun around the house again. So, OK, what advice then would you have if somebody's listening to this? They are looking at crowdfunding. They're looking at Kickstarter specifically. Yeah. And then, of course, there are, there are other models. Sure. Uh, what advice do you have for them? You know, don't don't make your mistakes. Yeah. They should do this. I've actually had this conversation with several of my friends and documentary filmmakers. So there's a place like Pub Slush where you can, if you don't get fully funded, you still get the money. Um, Indiegogo is is built more around publishing. Kickstarter is really hard for books. People want to fund like Veronica Mars. They want to fund films and visual things and webcasts, and it's great. Like, I love it. I, I go and I, I fund other people's stuff all the time. What I would say is this. First of all, think of yourself as a professional. So when I did the book, I had the book proposal done before I ever went on Kickstarter. People could read the whole proposal. They could read a chapter. I, I didn't just launch this thing. I put the budget out there. I said, here's how the budget will be used. And then the mistake I made was I, I would have spent two to three months networking, talking to important people that could reach folks likely to be interested in what I did. I would have brought them on board in an advisory board capacity to help me raise money for this long before I launched the Kickstarter. So when I launched it, I wasn't asking for money. They would have been asking for money. They would have been promoting this out. Um, and that, I think, is the – depending on how much money you're trying to make, that's the – that's the key is to make sure you have a team of people because you'll the reason you see the Kickstarter hockey stick, right? Which is it, whatever you get on the first day, that's going to be 80% of what you get for the whole project or something like that. It's because that's everybody, you know, everybody, you know, has already contributed on day one. And so it's important to make sure that that hockey stick doesn't happen. And the way that you do that is you get other people to also promote out what you're doing and to be partners in what you're doing. And when you're partnering with folks, you have to figure out what is it that their benefit, what benefit do they get? Helping you raise money is not a benefit to them. And so, you know, if I could go back and, and redo that, I would have done things like partnered with the Indiana Writers Center and I would have offered free classes on how to publish digital stuff for everybody that, you know, gave me more than $75. Um, and I would have given a part of that proceed to the Indiana Writers Center, right? Like th there are things that you can do to make sure that these kinds of groups are helping promote you. And that's the thing, right? It's Kickstarter is about a community. It's not just about you getting money. And I think for writers, it's important for them to think about what benefit do your partners get by helping you promote your project? And then the money's not for me. The money was to hire professionals so that we do a, a job that looks like a book. And then I'll hire a PR firm so that the book is in places where people can buy it. That's the promise that I've made to folks. I may miss deadlines. I've totally missed deadlines. I've not hit any deadline. But everybody can see what I do. I tell everybody when I'm behind. And I tell them this is all because I want to do something that everybody's proud of. And I've gotten no money. No money has come to me. And and something you said about the Kickstarter experience also ties back in with uh, some of the other things we talked about. The You, you mentioned you, you told a story. You told a story about the book. Yep. And it comes back to, I guess, the question we had about how important is it to talk to people as an author. This is exactly why if some of them, the light bulb's going to come on and they'll say, oh, this is why I need to learn how to talk to people is at some point I'm going to ask them for money. Yep. Be interesting yes. so that they want to give you money. Yes. When I talk to authors about their work, 
Like in my writing group and my writing collective, like these are the conversations we have. But somehow we get out amongst the public and that goes away. And I hate that because writing is so important. As I tell my students, whenever you uncover a new civilization, they go to two places. They want to find out where people live and they want to find a library. Those are the two places that they want to know about. I can't do anything about your house, but I can do a whole lot about your library. And so, you know, like that's for writers. They need to they need to think of themselves that way, whether they're at a traditional house or not. They have to think I'm a professional amateur and I need to treat my work as such. And if I don't, I can't expect people to read me. If I'm not a good storyteller and I don't engage my audience, I can't wonder why nobody knows who I am. I feel so much like an indie rock, you know, uh, uh, label in 1987, right? Like, you know, I'm touch and go records where you're just like, no, no, it's okay to take yourself seriously just because Random House hasn't given you a contract. That's fine. Like that does not bestow upon you the ability to take yourself seriously. And if nothing else comes out of the geeky press and what we've done, if we can start to work with people and help them think about what they do as professional, I'll be happy. You know, like, I'll feel like my time has been well spent. All right, so let's make sure people know how to find all of these things online. So you, your personal site is thedudeman.net. That's the teaching right? site. That's the teaching yep. site. Where do we point people? Where, where do you want people to go? The easiest place to go if you want to find out everything is uh, thebradking.com. And so, and so from here, uh, there are links to information about the Gigi Press uh, here you are on stage at the South by Southwest. Yep. That's cool. Uh, links to Facebook. Um, right. Okay. So everybody can find everything at the Brad King. Yes. Dot com. That's me. Well, great. Well, Brad, thank you very much for being with us today. No, this was great. Thanks for having me. This has been DIY author. Please visit us online at DIYauthor.com and be sure to sign up for our email newsletter. If you enjoyed this program, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. Until next time, keep writing. And remember, do-it-yourself doesn't have to mean do-it-alone.